Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. Joining us today is Keith Whittington. He's the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University and author of the new book, Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thank you so much. You say at the beginning of your book that the problem of free speech on college campuses, quote, is not new, but is newly relevant. What makes it newly relevant? Well, I think it's newly relevant in part um, in part because we're seeing – I think we're seeing more episodes, although it is a little tough to tell um, whether the episodes are actually increasing or we're just um, – or they're just more visible. And we're aware that there are more episodes um, over time. I think there's certainly some ideologies represented on campus that are very critical of free speech. I think there are sort of a general background of a lot of students really not appreciating the value of free speech and why the principles might matter. And as a consequence, I think their commitment to free speech is not as strong as, as we might hope for. So there are some, I think, particular variations of the current free speech problem that are that are distinctive. Some of the problem may be a little more important than it might have been, say, 10 or 15 years ago. But it's also true, I think we should be cautious and, and recognize this isn't a unique threat to the republic. It's not like we've never experienced students who are intolerant before or, or for that matter, experienced Americans who are sometimes intolerant before. What sort of past university free speech, you, you write about some instances in the book, uh, and it wasn't always uh, liberals against conservatives, correct? It used, used to be the other way around in many different instances, and it's been going on for a while. It often used to be the other way around. I mean, in the 19th century, universities were very closed off institutions, um, gradually changed toward the end of the 19th century. But um, through much of their early history, universities were very conservative institutions, often religious institutions, um, um, and and didn't view themselves as necessarily skeptically searching for the truth, open to controversial uh, new ideas and unconventional thinking. That changed in the late 19th century and in the 20th century, but even still, um, across the 20th century, universities were often um, uh, not as open as, as we might like. And, and the pressures came from various places. Often they came from outside universities, so from parents and alumni and from politicians. Um, campus administrators were often relatively conservative um, compared to the students. And so you often did see um, campus administrators partially out of their own beliefs, but partially in response to worries about what will the parents think and that kind of stuff, um, really trying to suppress students um, who are often on the left, but maybe just sometimes culturally and socially on the left. So um, students who uh, were too profane or talked about sex too much or various things like that, or sometimes faculty. Um, and campus administrators are trying to shut that down um, uh, out of a concern about protecting the brand as, as they understood it. And so it was a, a somewhat different kind of censorship and motivated by somewhat different concerns. But in some ways, it's kind of familiar. How much of these concerns – or, or I guess the, the activities and the behavior that are, are leading to these concerns unique to universities. How much of this is like I guess a, a problem of the universities versus just the universities are representative of the culture as a whole? Because we have – so we have left-wing students protesting speakers on campuses right now. But we also have the, – the right in this country has become very hostile to free speech. They're just not doing it on universities as much. So are they the, – are they just a symptom of a broader problem? Right. I think in lots of ways they are a symptom of a broader problem. I, I think of this as being a um, larger problem of the culture and of society, which is why I think it's important for not just students and faculty and campus administrators to come to a better understanding about the principles of free speech and what it means to have a civil society. But it's important for parents and alumni and general voters and politicians um, to get, have a better appreciation for those liberal values as well. Um, in part because they express their intolerance on a college campus, but they also express their intolerance in lots of other places and contexts as well. So universities are particularly visible episode of um, a kind of conflict that I think is a, um, a broader societal conflict um, that, that we should be concerned about in general. It's also true that universities, I think, are an important site in American society for vetting controversial ideas, um, that we want universities to be places where people can explore um, things outside the mainstream um, in various ways. And so 
people who are hostile to that then have a particular interest in sometimes trying to capture those institutions and make sure that only their unconventional ideas um, find a home there. Um, but others also have an interest in trying to shut that down precisely so those institutions um, can't explore um, unconventional and, and controversial um, ideas. And I think it's important for the vibrancy of American society ultimately um, to have institutions playing that kind of role that they were trying to carve out for themselves of, of there are going to be places where ideas are going to be taken very seriously. Um, there are going to be places where ideas can be explored um, that may not be in the mainstream um, uh, more generally. Um, there, and that students can get exposed to ideas there. And, and there's also a place where people can make mistakes intellectually and, and learn from them. Um, and those are all important things that we should want to value about um, universities and try to preserve. Can, can liberal societies, liberal values support the speech of people who would like to tear those values down is there inconsistency there? If they, if they if they in fact won, then all of these principles would go away. Sure, I mean I think it's a problem in in it's a problem in liberal theory um, and how to think about um, how much do you tolerate the intolerant. Um, I think it's a but it's also a genuine political and social problem in some context. Um, uh, what do you do on the extremes? And, and I think there may be circumstances and cases where you have to reevaluate depending on the particular situation that you're in. So, so for example, I teach, among other things, free speech to um, uh, college students. And among the kinds of um, uh, court cases I put in front of them to uh, think about are um, blasphemy cases from the United States in the 19th century. One thing that's interesting, you know, so most people, of course, don't think that we ever had blasphemy laws, let alone blasphemy cases um, in the 19th century. And what's also striking is courts generally upheld blasphemy convictions uh, in the 19th century. This is just saying goddamn or something? Yeah, well, yeah. all kinds of things, including things like um, – um, Jesus wasn't really the son of God. And oh, so all, heresy too. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. So all kinds of things, including, you know, but standing outside people's church services and screaming at them that, that you're all sinners and you're worshiping in the wrong church. And so there's a wide variety of things, but that could get yourself charged under these kind of provisions at the time. And it's a little shocking given your expectations about what constitutional law looks like in the 21st century that, that judges thought it was perfectly consistent to have blasphemy uh, convictions and to have the First Amendment, uh, for example, um, in place. But part of what I try to get students to think about is that those things were often justified not on the grounds of we have to protect the truth of God and we ought to marshal the state in support of that. But instead, the argument was um, these people are disrupting the public peace. If you stand outside a church and say bad things about the things that people in that church believe, you're going to start a fight. And the way that the state should intervene in order to prevent that disturbance of the peace from occurring is to whisk away the person that's causing the disturbance by saying the things that people are going to be offended by. And that was the way the law generally worked until, and not only in this context of blasphemy, but in other contexts as well, that if you had a provocative speaker, the concern was somebody's going to have a fight with that provocative speaker and the person who ought to be prosecuted for it is the speaker and not the person who wants to throw the punch. And the challenge for students is to think about, well, if you imagine yourself living in a society in which is genuinely the case that people are going to haul off and start hitting each other on the basis of what people are saying to each other. What is the right legal rule to have in that kind of context? And do you, as a judge, for example, have to take really seriously the problem of how are we going to have a peaceful society in which people are all um, on the edge of throwing punches all the time um, or worse, right? And that's a genuine problem, I think, in some social context. And so part of what I think we've gained over the course of American history is we've shifted the burden, right? So we've told people it's not okay to throw a punch even if you – you shouldn't punch the Nazis, right? Even if, even if you find them extremely provocative and offensive and disturbing. But in the 19th century, we sort of said, well, it's natural to throw the punch. And it was so, an honor, much more honor society. It was more of, of an honor society. We accepted violence as being a more sort of everyday a, a part of, of society in common. And I think it's a genuine advance that we don't think that way anymore, right? Inste instead, we put the burden on people to say, look, you should control yourself. Well, um, in Chaplinsky, is, what did he right. call him? A damn fascist? No, exactly that, right. right. Is it, the court ruled that that wasn't protected speech because clearly you're going to have to sock someone in the nose if you call him a damn fascist. Right. So Chaplinsky is an important case from the early part of the 20th century, um, characterizes um, so-called fighting words um, as not being protected by the Constitution um, and specifically by the First Amendment. That general notion of fighting words was something um, – it's given sort of new form in Chaplinsky, but it was something that was sort of recognizable um, under the law previous to that. And in Chaplinsky's case, it's sort of representative of the complication that Chaplinsky was um, 
a Jehovah's Witness. He went. Um, he was a street, a sidewalk preacher. Um, would say controversial things that people found deeply offensive because he would criticize their religion. Um, and he'd go in neighborhoods precisely in order to criticize people's religions, and people get hot under the collar about it. And in this particular case, then not only were people getting hot under the collar about what he was saying about the religion, but then when the cops tried to drag him away. He started calling the cops fascists, and the cops said, well, now you've gone too far, um, and, and charged him uh, with, with a crime as a consequence. I mean, Chaplinsky raises then both of the questions. How, and, so, and people want to say, well, fighting words, we shouldn't protect that under the Constitution. And, and the court since then has sort of really backed off that, and so it's not clear there's anything left of that um, initial move. But people who find themselves attracted to that notion, um, fighting words are unprotected, you have to think seriously about, well, okay, well, how do you feel about somebody like Chaplinsky, right? So the sidewalk preacher who says things people find offensive and people are worried he might start a fight and therefore he's on the wrong side of law on that basis. And he wants to call the cops names um, and, and the cops find that offensive. Um, that's what the court was concerned about suppressing there. And, and if you really think that fighting words aren't protected by the Constitution, you should come to grips with the fact that you're okay with the idea of if you call the cops a pig – um, they can arrest you and put you in jail for that. I mean, right? they can they can do that almost any time anyway. But <laughs> well, I mean, so that's of course that's part of the problem now. I mean, the, the courts I think have been increasingly clear, and, and there have been subsequent cases where cops continue to try to arrest people through the sixties and seventies, for example, um, uh, on the basis of calling them names. Um, and the courts were increasingly carving away at that and saying, well, that's not for that's protected speech. You're allowed to to do that. Um, and sort of what we now sort of are find ourselves in, I think it's a legal regime where the courts say, well, you can't actually prosecute somebody, um, but that doesn't necessarily prevent the police on occasion from arresting you and throwing you in the hoosegow for um, a few hours um, before you come out. And, and actually, there's been cases that are same on like flag burning, for example, even after the court said flag burning is constitutionally protected, there's still been instances of the police will arrest somebody uh, for burning the flag in part because they're worried about community reactions and other kinds of things. Um, but they won't prosecute you because they know they can't make a prosecution stick, um, but they nonetheless can um, uh, take you out of circulation for a little bit. This concern grounded in provocation, uh, I wonder how much that gets to answering something I was curious, I've been curious about, which is you know, campuses have been so. This gets framed as you know, the, these left-wing students are rejecting ideas that they disagree with. But campuses have been left-wing. Sure. That's not a new feature. But like when I was in college in the late '90s and early 2000s on a very left-wing campus, I don't recall any instances of speakers being, you know, disinvited because there were threats of protests and so on and so forth. One of the things that strikes me as different now is that the the bolder like campus republicans or other more conservative groups they would invite speakers but they weren't inviting speakers expressly in order to provoke like speakers who who had nothing to contribute to a debate and exchange of ideas other than being provocative right. and so is that is that one of the things that's changed is that what's caused it or are there other things going on that's made this a problem now so, so I think it's a little hard to tell because we just don't have enough empirical evidence to know for sure. I, so, so I went to college a little earlier than that. I was in college in the late 80s. Um, we didn't have those kind of episodes on the college campus I was on either. And I suspect that one thing that was happening was that there were places where people were being disinvited and shouted down. It just wasn't getting reported in the same way. And so we were less aware of the extent to which it happened because it's also true now that you could be on any average college campus and never experience during your four years there a single instance of somebody being disinvited or shouted down because it's not that common. Um, but it does happen um, and, and happens a fair amount across the country as a whole. Um, and now we're very aware of how often it happens in a way that might not have been equally true in the 90s or the 80s, for example. So it's a little harder to know whether it's actually happening more. And I think these things do probably go in waves a little bit too. And so there were instances of people getting shouted down in the 60s, for example, um, that were very visible and prominent sort of episodes of that happening. Um, and so it may have been that, that that went away a little bit in the 80s and 90s, for example, now is making a comeback um, to some degree. Um, on the other hand, I wrote for a conservative college paper, for example, and that conservative college paper was routinely vandalized and thrown away and destroyed by um, uh, liberal students on college campus at the time. And so we didn't have shouting down episodes, but we had plenty of other episodes of efforts by, in that case, the political left 
um, to try to suppress speech. And so those things are persistent. I think partially there's also a um, sort of international left-wing movement that has embraced what was called in Europe sort of no-platforming kind of positions um, that um, encourages disinvitations and um, disruptions of speech. And that was very common in Europe and in England, for example. And I think now it's migrated to the United States. So to some degree, I think we're seeing tactics and ideas about how to suppress speech and under what circumstances and in what ways that that people in other countries were dealing with before we had to deal with them here. And so I think that's grown. But then, as you say, I think there's this other issue of groups on campus and off campus that are funding and encouraging speakers to come to campus precisely to rile people up and try to provoke people. There's a business model um, that some want to exploit that they get attention and it's good for them to ultimately um, have their speeches disrupted. And so they're perfectly happy to have it happen. And, and I think that's a relatively new phenomenon as too. I mean, there are people who were controversial, including some people that were um, well outside the mainstream and would get themselves invited to campuses in, in earlier periods in American history, including 80s and 90s, uh, for example, um, but not quite in the same way and with not quite the same intent as what we would see, I think, with some of the people now. And, and so, so I think we also have this then really problematic dynamic between some people on the right who want to be as provocative and stick a finger in people's eye um, and people on the left that are more than happy to rise to the bait. How should we feel about trigger warnings in the, in the, I mean, we, we talked about the fighting words and that there's some sort of line between calling someone a damn fascist or something else that would make someone punch you and then, and then the other things that disrupt and things that make people very upset. And now we have this trigger warnings thing. And of course, the conservatives love to make fun of the snowflakes on college campuses right. and all this stuff. And, and, but, but maybe it was the case that for a very long time, we didn't take uh, triggering seriously enough. Right. Um, uh, so is that something we should endorse or, or at least be wary, maybe endorse and be wary about? Yes, yeah, so I think this notion of trigger warnings in safe spaces is sort of what gives rise, in particular, this sort of idea of a snowflake generation that's particularly sensitive and delicate and um, can't confront sort of the hard reality of the world um, kind of thing. Once you dive into sort of looking at sort of the arguments surrounding trigger warnings in safe space and the people who are advocating for those kinds of notions, um, there's a kernel of um, something genuine and real in that that we all take seriously. So um, in the context specifically of trigger warnings, there's a genuine concern that some people might find things not merely offensive, but in fact mentally, emotionally disabling in a way that can interfere with their um, educational progress. And it's unfair to um, expose those students to things in a way that they um, can neither accommodate nor anticipate um, that's going to take place. I think the problem is that, and so there's a there's a genuine therapeutic core. Yeah, like parental advisory. Right. And, and you might think, of course, it's also sort of unproblematic in, the, in exactly this context of parental advisories and the like. That's, that's sort of much more familiar of saying, well, you should get a warning as to what you're about to be exposed to. And in some ways, of course, in college, I think we ought to be doing that. We ought to, be, we ought to have a syllabus that tells people what the content of the class is, that tells people what they're um, going to be exposed to. Those don't, I think a standard syllabus doesn't quite get to the um, level of detail and specific content warning that people who advocate for trigger warnings um, are sometimes looking for. I think there's also nothing necessarily problematic about uh, individual faculty members deciding on their own that I should warn students about what they're about to encounter because I want to prepare them um, in various ways for, for, for the material they're about to see on a video, for example, or um, in a text or the, a conversation we're about to have in class. And I think that's totally reasonable and appropriate. The thing that I think we ought to be concerned about is sort of blanket policy and campus administrators saying everybody ought to adopt these trigger warnings, even in circumstances where the faculty think it's inappropriate um, or, or unwise, in part because it will alter how those conversations go in class, but also there's a real worry that if you have to start including trigger warnings on things, that one will discourage some students from taking classes they otherwise ought to take and from reading materials they otherwise ought to read, that, that you've scared them away from it by attaching a trigger warning to it. But it also seems like it might encourage. It might encourage some too. No, exactly. So it's sort of the video nasties phenomenon, right? If Once you've labeled this as banned in Boston, then people are going to come rushing out to uh, try to see it. Uh, what's this thing I've been banned from seeing? Um, well, that's kind of boring as it turns 
turns out. So yeah, there is that I think. But the other and but the other concern likewise is if you have to include it on uh, that if there's a mandatory policy that if you're going to do certain things you have to include a trigger warning that the easier thing to do is okay I'll drop that off the syllabus right I just won't do that because I don't want to deal with the hassle of of administrators looking over my shoulder and students complaining about it and all that kind of stuff and then you potentially are going to lose some really serious things out of your um, curriculum and what universities are covering if everybody is um, being overly cautious about what they're willing to expose students for because they're trying to avoid controversy um, in, in one way or another. And as, as a consequence, you're, you know, it's, it's, it's a similar worry to worrying about sort of dumbing down the curriculum, but it's a, it's a worry of, of how do we go to the, sort of the least common denominator, least offensive thing possible um, and only expose students to that. And, and that's just a shoddier education um, than what you'd hope college students are generally going to get. You mentioned professors sort of reacting to this. And sometimes you hear stories that they're afraid in the, in the current regime, that they're afraid of getting a report from a student, getting a report that you did X, Y, and Z, whether it's something totally innocuous or whatever. And that is seemingly sufficient to, to – that's, that's it. Accusation is guilt. That's – and you're done. Do you think that's true? I think there are places where that's really true. I think there are other places where maybe that's a little less true. I mean – and, and I, I guess I would um, – um, say there's sort of various ways that might play out, right? And so one one way in which you might imagine um, uh, worrying about the reaction as a consequence sort of self-censoring as to how you do things um, is you just worry about the hassle of having to deal with it, right? And so do I really want students camped out in my office? Do I really want students to come screaming at me? Do I really want to worry about students complaining and having to deal with the emails or the phone calls or the whatevers? And so the more you think that you're in an environment in which that might happen, right, then it just leads you to shy away from anything that you think might deal with it just because, you know, you don't need that in your life. Um, so, so that's one kind of concern, right, just sort of worried about – people worrying about the environment they're in and just thinking it's too much of a hassle even if there's no sort of broader repercussions. Um, just, just this isn't a thing I need to worry about if I can, if I can work my way around it. The other thing though is, is – is, genuine occasions where you worry that there might be professional consequences to it. Um, and so if you're untenured, um, if you're an adjunct um, who's working on a semester-by-semester -semester contract, for example, it's a serious threat if students are lodging complaints against you and objecting um, to what you're um, teaching. And so for a lot of administrators in lots of places, why should they second-guess that, right? So a student complains about somebody, they're a contingent faculty anyway fine, we just won't hire that person again to teach in the future. We'll hire somebody else. Um, that kind of risk averseness about people who don't have um, larger protections than tenure to their um, teaching um, can easily wind up sort of getting people um, uh, disciplined and professionally in very consequential ways um, as a consequence of that. And the other thing I think is on, on some university campuses, the environment is just so bad and sensitive on some of these issues that um, even if you're fully protected by tenure, you might think the consequences are going to be quite dramatic um, uh, socially, if not necessarily um, economically, but maybe you know in terms of your ability to stay on that campus. Um, if you get um, too many students upset with you, too riled up, if administrators get too upset with you, and there's certainly I've, – I've talked to faculty on some campuses that see their – local environment is poisonous enough. You know, it's, it's not just this would be a hassle, but they think their life would be um, dramatically um, uh, messed up if they find themselves embedded in one of those controversies. Are there characteristics of the campuses that seem to make this kind of behavior more or less likely? Like, is it, you know, really small liberal arts colleges have it the worst? Public universities are better than pro – I don't no, but are there, are there ways, are there things that seem to be going on that predict this? So I think it's a little hard to tell because, again, I think we have a sort of data problem of really knowing what's happening across all these campuses. It's, it's clear that there are some things that, that occur on any campus. I don't think any campus is really immune from it. But, but it is true that places that seem worse are, are smaller liberal arts colleges, um, often relatively elite um, colleges, although not always. Yeah, you know, I think in part because they are more um, humanities-centric, uh, those colleges, and humanities are, are – the places where there's the most uh, intellectual debate over some of those issues, whereas if you're in a larger, more complex campus where a good chunk of your students are business majors or engineering majors and the like, right, those students aren't as interested in those things. They aren't in classes that's encouraging that kind of stuff. And so that's a more div intellectually diverse campus on certain dimensions that might matter um, compared to a smaller Lamar College. I think the small places are just also more homogeneous and and – the campus culture can be more stifling if you're not careful, and so there are fewer places to hide. And so if you find yourself 
in an environment with 4,000 students, and even if it's only a small fraction of them, they're willing to be really vocal and annoying, um, you may find yourself in a position of saying, you know, do I really want to go the next four years having to live in this environment where these 15 students are um, really mad at me? Um, whereas, you know, I was an undergraduate at a giant state university. You know, lots of us were anonymous. It's easy to escape other people. Um, you know, your worries are just different in that kind of environment than in an environment in which there may be four or 5,000 students. When this stuff is going on at – so pick a campus where we seem to think that this kind of stuff is bad. Um, whether it's a broadly cultural – like characteristic of the students or a handful of essentially hecklers veto style bad apples. And so if it's if it's really concentrated among bad apples, why are administrators so willing to capitulate? Like why can't they just say, look, you – like if you're offended by this or you're having a problem with this or you're going to be disruptive, maybe our university is not the place for you. I think in part we're going through a moment where we're trying to figure out how many bad apples there are. <laughs> and so and so there is some uncertainty, I think genuine uncertainty among most the students themselves but also administrators and faculty about just how popular are these ideas, how many students feel this way. And so we're in a bit of a feeling out process. And and so I, I actually think that in most cases it's a relatively small set of students that are – that are most committed to some of these um, illiberal ideas, but there's genuine uncertainty about how big that population really is, and and I think we're now going through a process, and I hope in part this book is encouraging it of trying to speak to, <laughs> to borrow a phrase, the silent majority um, on a college campus where most people um, aren't committed to those ideas, and as a consequence, um, uh, can be led to say, look, you don't have to go along with that; you can pull back, um, and and so. Um, so you can do some of that, I think. And so, so there's some question of sort of teasing apart, well, how many people really are talking about it and are they isolated minority, et cetera. Um, for some campuses, that minority, though, is big and then it becomes much more troubling. So I, I worry that a place like Millbury, for example, may find itself in that kind of situation where, in fact, the number of students who are really committed to those ideas are quite large. And sometimes they're in campus leadership. And so it's not just that these are easily isolated in individuals that you can punish and then move on. Instead, it's it's really picking fights with large contingents of your campus population, uh, including campus population that may be supported by sympathetic faculty and sympathetic administrators. Um, and that's a tough fight for people to pick. And Aaron mentioned we went to Boulder together and one of the uh, things, classes that we'd like to take, uh, we, we took a fair amount of literary criticism classes. Uh, we, in, we enjoyed them. Uh, they're they're kind of like a, a game and listen to some interesting <laughs> stuff and you can read some Foucault every now and then, which is not the worst thing ever. Uh, it's probably not historically accurate, but it's not the worst thing ever. But if you, you in that world, uh, it was like 15 years ago, I, I saw that there was a ideology of how the power structures of the world were kind of distorting it and oppressing people. And one of those parts of those power structures was speech, for example, just, just the, the, the words that we use to describe things that it embedded in there is the patriarchy and race stuff and all these things. Um, and that, I think, is some of what is being said when they say words are violence and then this is going to be a problem and we need to stop people from saying these things because an entire system of violence has been put up around people and words are part of that. Um, and so they want action and they want people to stop talking about things that have created a bad world in their view. Uh, and that's what they view as hate. How, how should we respond to that, that viewpoint? And, and what, I mean, they might have, they kind of, I mean, the world is, has been power structures that weren't very friendly to minorities for a very long time and trying to reform that might require talking in a different way. And so should we say, no, 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 we should just say everything we want or should we, or should we accept some of their premises? I think it's perfectly reasonable to accept some of their premises, right? I mean, I've I've learned a lot from Foucault. I encourage people to go read Foucault and and um, others along that path. I mean, I'd, and likewise, in researching the book, for example, spent a lot of time reading people who are advocating for trigger warnings, which turns on a different kind of argument. But but you know, in, in often, the same general, but path, in the yeah. same general path. But 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 more generally, I often find that things that seem um, like very pernicious ideas or silly ideas that if you start digging into them and find the people that are most serious about them, there's often something interesting there. Um, and there's a there's a real starting point in those ideas that you want to take seriously. Um, 
that doesn't mean it's necessarily right, but it often means that what you're seeing expressed most often is sort of a crude version of it or, or a, um, a boulderized or exaggerated version of it that is being applied in simplistic ways. And, and that ought to be resisted, but that doesn't mean you necessarily ought to throw away the, the baby with the bathwater. Um, it's a challenge to find the baby sometimes. Sometimes there's an awful lot of dirty bathwater. Um, uh, but yeah, but, but, but I think we ought to, and especially those of us on college campuses who are trying to take ideas seriously, we have an obligation to try to sort of really think about the ideas at play here. Um, and then and then, having explored those ideas and tried to c- come to grips with them, you want to think about, okay, well, what are the good parts of this? And how do we go about trying to salvage those good parts and try to reconcile them with the larger set of liberal structures that you think are, are important? Um, and, are, and can they be reconciled? Um, if you think they are serious ideas, but maybe necessar- not necessarily good ideas, then you want to think about how do we resist those ideas and encourage people to turn away from them um, in, in various ways. And, and I think that's the challenge confronting us on some of these issues, that that um, that the idea that words are violence comes out of an intellectual tradition I think is a serious intellectual tradition. It makes some valuable and important points about how the social world is constructed and how power gets exercised within it. Um, and um, we shouldn't be too dismissive of that. Um, on the other hand, we shouldn't get too caught up in the metaphor <laughs> um, <laughs> and lose sight of the fact that the words themselves are not actually violence. Um, <laughs> the violence means a thing and the violence is means, violence. Right, no, yeah. Exactly. We ought to be able to distinguish these two things. And moreover, then we ought to talk seriously about well, how do we go about changing that? So even if you think that that there are coercive social structures, for example, that have been built up in part through certain kinds of linguistic discourses, um, from a classical liberal perspective – that's a perfectly reasonable thing to think and, and something one ought to take seriously. And then you ought to think about, OK, how do you effectively dismantle that? Um, and there, I think we're going to have just lots of disagreements between those of us who come out of a more of a classical liberal tradition and those who are coming out of uh, certain other traditions who might think, you know, well, the best way of dismantling that is to have the state smash it in various kinds of ways. And from a classical liberal perspective, you might think, you know, there are lots of problems with giving the state a great big hammer to smash things with because – It'll be used against you next. It's going to be used <laughs> against you next, right? And we ought to worry about that. And, and that's very much my worry and this concern, right? And so, so my starting point is not to say, oh, don't be stupid. Of course, words don't matter, right? No, words matter. Right? They matter a lot. We all take them really seriously. And, and so we all worry about these things. The question is how do you respond to it? Right? What's the best way of moving forward um, given, given those concerns? And you know, I'm committed to thinking that the best way of, of dealing with that is, is not by empowering censors with a lot of power to suppress things, not by shouting down speakers, um, but to expose ideas to critical scrutiny and engage them. Um, and then in, in the long run, we'll be better off as a consequence of that. One of the things that seems to motivate <clears throat> at least some of this and you you see it not just in the we're going to shut down conservative speakers on campuses but like the um the gay wedding bake shop case is is almost what I'll call like a culture war victory lap that that the the left has I think I mean has won the culture wars um they're they're basically over and the left won um, and so now the left rock and roll is here to stay. Is yeah. what Aaron is now, now you're just doing the mopping. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So now yeah. they're just now they're just grinding it in. They're you know and and so that there isn't a motivation. They're not about protecting people. They're not about protecting people from triggers or creating an environment, but just putting their boots in the necks of those social conservatives who they battled for so long. If that's what's going on, that seems like that's a harder. That's a harder thing to fight back against because you can't say, well, we need free speech or exchange of ideas because people are just it's, – it's just gloating. But then on the other hand, maybe that – they get that out of their system. Well, I, I think there's a little bit of that on both sides. I think there are people on the right who um, – um, and sometimes they think they have legitimate grievances but but for whatever reason, they think that I, I want to see liberal tears and I want to stick my thumb in the eye um, and, and that's going to make my life better and more pleasant in various kinds of ways if I do that. Um, and I think similarly, there are people on the left that are genuinely interested in saying, no, no, I want to rub it in and I want to show that um, you aren't going to be tolerated around here and um, that will make them feel better about um, uh, their position um, in various kinds of ways. And uh, yeah, and some of that's n- natural in, at one level on a college. It's natural to the culture war in general, right? People are going to feel that way. Um, in some ways, it's, it's natural, I think, to college campuses because students of that age are likely um, to be a little more enticed to want to behave that way. 
Um, that, Juvenile that, delinquents, basically. It, yeah. it sort of comes with. I mean, there's a reason why pr- pr- provocative speakers are popular on college campuses, right? And so, and, and not only because sometimes you just want to burn things down, especially you when you're 19 things. years old. Yeah. Sometimes you just want to burn things down, right? <laughs> and so um, that, that's totally right. And so, and so we should recognize that this is, and that's one reason why these things are kind of endemic and they repeat on college campuses. And you sort of have to accept the fact that um, these are sort of ongoing efforts to how do you deal with this. And it's a, and to some degree, it is a management problem rather than a um, somehow we're going to drive it out and it will never happen again. <laughs> instead, instead, it is a question of, OK, well, when it rears itself up, how the best do you do you deal with it so that it's not too disruptive and the main activity of the university uh, can, can continue? And I think it's also true that we want to be able to separate and we should encourage other people to separate um, those who are acting in bad faith from those who are acting in good faith, right? I mean, there are some people who are who hold ideas that we might think are genuinely provocative, but they are genuinely trying to advance those ideas, and they're they're trying to get you to think about what they take to be serious and important ideas, and and that's one thing, right? And and those people may be wrong, you, you may find them um, dangerous, even in the kinds of ideas they hold, um, but but that's one kind of person, right? And and, and in some ways. You want to encourage those people um, on college campus because, because at least those people are grappling with ideas and, and you can engage them. There are other people who are acting in just bad faith, right? I mean that they they want to fly under the banner of whether it's inclusivity on the left or free speech at the moment on the right. Um, but what they really want to accomplish is something else. And you know, and and those people, I think you do have to deal with a little differently and and, and recognize what they're what they're going to do. And if this is in part a management problem, how does management? start to fix it? I think partially you do want good rules in place on college campuses that um, um, uh, are consistent with free speech principles in general, um, but are um, uh, trying to coordinate the use of the space in a way that allows everybody to conduct their own activities without too much disruption from others. Um, And sometimes you need to sanction and discipline people who violate those rules um, in reasonable ways. But it's also a question of trying to educate students about what it is they're getting into and how they ought to behave on college campuses and try to um, lead them to behave in better ways. So, for example, I think one reason why Princeton, um, where I teach, has not had very many of these kinds of problems, um, uh, knock on wood, right, so far, um, hopefully we won't um, in the future either. Um, I think partially it helps that our faculty and our administration is deeply committed to free speech principles and they've been clear about that and they've articulated it and students understand that and faculty and administrators understand that and so everybody's sort of on the same page um, in some ways or at least understands what the page is and, and behaves accordingly. And it helps, I think, that we have, for example, people who are serious thinkers on both the left and the right who can treat each other respectfully, can articulate those ideas. Like and Robbie and Cornell. Like Rob, Rob, Robbie, Robbie George, George and, and Cornell and, West, for example. Peter Singer, who's a very controversial person on campuses, mostly from the political left, is on um, Princeton campus as well. And as a consequence, th- students can see it's possible to be a serious conservative, for example, by looking at Robbie George and say, OK, well, this person has ideas that I disagree with dramatically. But he's a serious person. He's nice and polite and civil, and you can actually engage him, and he'll think about problems, and, and you can have a conversation, and you can learn something from that person, right? And and that's a really useful thing for students to see, right? If instead they think, well, what it means to be a conservative is is a Richard Spencer or a Milo um, or a, or the average Fox News celebrity. You know, that's a very different image in their head about what it means to invite somebody like that to campus and, and, and to tolerate them and those kind of things. And so, so you want to expose students to serious people with serious ideas who are capable of, of talking in good faith and, and even if you disagree with them. Um, and I think on the political right, we've sort of lost that a little bit by having people, for example, trying to bring in people who are only provocative and aren't really um, uh, uh, articulating good ideas in a reasonable way. So for you know, one of the things I valued when I was in college was William F. Buckley came to campus one time, for example, which who I got to go see. I admired Buckley in lots of ways. I had disagreements with him in various kinds of ways. But he was a serious person, right, and capable of engaging in a serious conversation, could, could give a, a, a good speech um, in a relatively entertaining way that both the left and the right could learn something from um, experiencing. Um, bringing a William F. Buckley to campus is a different kind of thing than bringing a Milo to campus, right? And we should be making more efforts to bring the equivalents of William F. Buckley to campus and, and less effort to bring the equivalent of Milo to campus. 
then should student groups that invite people like Milo be disciplined for that? So rather than saying we're not going to let Milo come and speak, you say like, look, this is you know not how adults behave. You don't invite people like this. I think it's an educational process. I mean, I think you, I think you, you, you need to engage them and talk to them seriously, and and hopefully, and, and hopefully they can find faculty administrators who who they respect. And I mean, part of the problem I think on college campuses is there are not a lot of role models at that level, right? And so instead, those students often feel isolated and under siege and they don't trust anybody um, in adult roles on campus, for example. They think they're all out to get them and so they don't want to listen to them. Um, so, so in some ways, you need serious engagement and, and to, try to, to try to bring them to a point where they can see, OK, look, it's not in your long-term interest to, to bring in um, somebody just for the sake of being provocative. Maybe there's better people we can bring in who um, are going to be interesting and useful and that you can appreciate. And, and so I think ultimately that's a that's a um, um, educational process more than it ought to be a, a process of disciplining. I mean, maybe there are circumstances where it's appropriate to try discipline students for something that they've done the front, but but I think that ought to be extremely rare. And it's hard to actually even think of of, of examples where that would be a sensible strategy. In the changing university environment, and there's a lot of discussion about the meaning of universities now and, and, and whether or not it's always good to go to university, and there's concerns about student loans, so we've seen big changes and maybe a little bit more savviness or discernment when picking a university. And so at University of Missouri, we saw an unbelievable dip in enrollment to the point of closing two or three dorms, I think, 30 percent after they had their highly prominent little protest. And insofar as parents are deciding to send their kids to different college, could it be the case that we eventually get to this point? Because you write a lot in the book about what universities are. But if some of these places, you know, Oberlin pops into mind because they've, they've been on the top of these lists for a very long time, uh, that they're not – maybe they just don't want to be universities. Maybe they want to be something more like Liberty University. Like, like it's a religious consciousness raising endeavor. We're not going to have free and open in inquiry here and you're going to know it. That's going to be right. on our mission statement. Um, and so – and if you want – if you go to Liberty University, you're also not looking for complete free and open inquiry. Uh, and so same thing. But then Princeton is going to say that's what you're going to get here. So actually that this will resolve itself in the sense that people will go to those universities choosing that and it will either be an open one or not and maybe those closed ones are not really universities anymore. I actually think that's fine in that sense. I mean, it's, it's okay for me. If, I, mean, I think one of the nice things about the American educational environment is it has a wide diversity of different kinds of institutions. They're, they're different cultures. They do different things. They pursue those missions differently, um, including religious institutions that are pursuing a very distinctive mission that's a little different than the one I described, but primarily being a truth-seeking institution on the model of a, a secular research institution like Princeton. And if a university or college like Oberlin, for example, wanted to self-consciously embrace that identity and say we're the equivalent of a faith-based institution except our faith is social justice, for example, um, and we're going to organize everything around that and we're going to have boundaries on intellectual um, uh, tolerance and intellectual inquiry on our campus on the basis of that, then, you know, give it a shot, right? And, it's, um, and if students want to go there, that's fine. I wouldn't encourage it. I wouldn't want to send my kid there. Um, I wouldn't want to teach there. Um, but – and what's striking about a lot of these places, of course, is they don't want to brand themselves that way, right? I mean, they, their administrators won't say that's what they do. Their faculty don't say that's what they do. Um, certainly, I, friends that I have who are on faculties at institutions like that are all very concerned precisely because they didn't think that's what they signed up for, um, right? And so there are some people on campus that say basically that's what this you know, college ought to be. Um, and then there's also people who say, wait a second, since when? Um, so. I think those will be worse institutions. That's not the model of higher education I think we would want to embrace in general. Um, my suspicion is the market demand for that is pretty small um, ultimately. Um, but if campuses want to brand themselves that way and go that direction, then you know, that's, I, I don't have anything against them for doing that. I wouldn't want to teach there though. <laughs> this free speech crisis, I'm putting that in scare quotes, uh, as you point out in the book, it, it's cyclical and we've discussed today. But it also comes at a time of extreme schismatic political undercurrent right. where it, Donald Trump's election has been a trigger, a triggering moment for many it's people on the left. <laughs> and, yes, it's driven everyone nuts, including right. Donald Trump. But aside right. from that, so yes. uh, the – so in, in, is it different now because we have all this data about polarization and all these things and then we have people who say it's not that bad but, it, but it's, from my perspective it seems pretty bad uh, and one thing that polarization might 
do is cause people to not understand the other side of the point that they think it's a, a benefit to shut them up. Um, so does that, do those factors make it worse now? And, and what do you see going forward in this sort of free speech discussion if that's part of the backdrop? I do think that's part of the backdrop. I think polarization makes it worse on college campuses. I also think that polarization um, um, should make us nervous that the kinds of problems we're seeing on college campuses could replicate themselves through American society more generally, right? And so college campuses, um, you know, is among faculty are, are relatively to the left, for example, the students are more diverse in general ideologically, um, but the faculty are going to the left. So, so they um, have their own ideological blind spots as a consequence of that. And, and that creates environments that some students and faculty on the right find less hospitable than they would hope. And it leads people to behave um, badly in various ways, in part because they aren't exposed enough to the other side. And they think the other side is extraordinarily threatening because they seem so ideologically distant from their own uh, set of views and perspectives, for example. And all their best friends. They, they, and all they their, never and, even and met and one. All yes. the best friends, right? I've, yeah. never, I've never even met somebody yeah, like that, yeah. right? So, of course, they're, they, you know, so it's easy to imagine the most horrible thing about the person from the other side because I've, you imagine I've never seen somebody like that before. And so they must be monsters um, uh, over there, right? And And... And that's a problem. It's a problem for universities, but it's a problem for American society in general that if we find ourselves in that position where we imagine people on the other side of the divide must be monsters um, because we hardly ever interact with them and all the interactions we have um, are are fraught and and mostly negative. Um, Universities, I think, ought to be a place where we are learning how to work through that. Right? That we that it's it's not going to make the polarization go away, um, but we but we have as a as a society to learn how to live with the polarization. Right? We need to be able to learn how to talk to each other and manage our disagreements, um, and and have a reasonable conversation and 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 settle things peacefully despite those disagreements. Um, and that's a I think that's a looming threat for the United States as we're dealing with this kind of. Um, polarized society more generally, and, and we're seeing a microcosm of that on, on college campuses. So I think one thing that college campuses ought to be contributing to American society um, is a model of how it is you can uh, uh, grapple with disagreements and, and, and learn how to tolerate it and overcome it and move forward productively with it. Um, and instead, I worry that universities will become the opposite. Instead, they will become models of, um, yeah, this is how the partisan warfare takes place. Um, and we're going to shout each other down. We're going to have fights on the street. And, and that's uh, what America is going to look like. Um, and and one reason why I wanted to write the book was precisely because I want to encourage not only those of us on college campuses not to behave that way, and we got to figure out a way of moving past these kind of disagreements um, product, and, and living together um, uh, in a peaceful and productive way. Um, but Americans more broadly who are confronting in their own ways these kinds of issues need to, to, need to learn it um, as, as well. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.